There's the drug, people take drugs, don't they, in boxing? They all take drugs, I'd say. If there's a performance enhancing drugs problem in the sport, the odds are that the best fighters in the sport are doing it. If you take drugs and you're getting into a ring to fight somebody else's son, it should be 10 year ban. If Ryan's caught, he did cheat. On April the 20th, 2024, Ryan Garcia shocked the boxing world by dropping Devin Haney three times en route to a majority decision victory. It would later come to light that Garcia tested positive twice for the banned substance Osterin on the day before and on the day of the upset victory. Osterin can be a useful tool in improving a boxer's performance through attaching to proteins in the body known as androgen receptors. Being a type of SARM, it enhances muscle growth which can be handy for fighters in the midst of a weight cut for a bout, maintaining strength and mass during caloric deficits. With Garcia denying the allegations, attributing the detection to the ashwagandha pills instead, the truth is not entirely clear cut. Yet, with professionals like Lucian Butte and Amir Khan being busted for the same substance in recent years, I want to navigate the infiltration of drugs into the sweet science before examining which concoctions fighters have adopted in attempts to make them unstoppable forces in the ring. But first, please consider liking and subscribing before we delve into a brief history of how drugs have been utilised to achieve unprecedented results. The beneficial impact of specific substances on the human condition has been explored for centuries now. The Romans cultivated opium to which Emperor Marcus Aurelius was addicted to. Viking berserkers famously fought in a trance-like state, likely as a result of taking agaric magic mushrooms and bog myrtle. The Icelandic contemporary historian Snorri Sturluson described them as mad dogs or wolves, bit their shields and were strong as bears or wild oxen. Perhaps better documented is the Third Reich's use of methamphetamine in the form of a pill known as pervitin. In his book Blitzed, Norman Ola argues that millions of these pills were distributed to Wehrmacht troops before the successful invasion of France. The drug enabled soldiers to stay awake for days at a time, marching many more miles or driving motorised vehicles and tanks without resting. Meanwhile, in the Vietnam War, the US military piled its servicemen with speed, steroids and painkillers to help handle extended combat scenarios. Unfortunately, it often boosted aggression, sometimes leading to tragic consequences. Boxing, of course, isn't directly analogous to war, although both fighters tend to enter the ring knowing full well that their life could be on the line. Unfortunately, we've had countless examples of this down the years. Perhaps that is what is so sinister about boxers dabbling in the dark arts of drugging, and, like in war, the narcotics are being ingested in order to inflict maximum damage upon an opposing side. But when exactly did boxers first start using performance enhancers? Throughout my research, it has been difficult to pin down an exact time period when drugs started to be used in the sweet science. Possibly because it's hard to ascertain exactly when doping tests were brought in by the various boxing federations, around the 1980s seems to be the best estimate. With the Soviets first using steroids around the 1950s, aiding their domination in international weightlifting competitions, the US physician John Ziegler was left playing catch-up at the 1960 Rome Olympics, administering the steroid Dianabol to the entire US weightlifting roster. Notably, Muhammad Ali was at this Olympics, making it likely he rubbed shoulders with these individuals and gained awareness of steroids. It's less clear when non-weightlifters started adopting steroids, but NFL player Lyle Alzado admitted on his deathbed that he had been a regular user since 1969. Some Reddit users point to Ali's transformation as being suspect, having been 178 pounds in the summer of 1960 and in early 1964 being 210 pounds with little to no more body fat than previously. Granted, this change took place between the ages of 18 and 22 when boys tend to bulk out into men, so that is a possible explanation, but I digress. One more fairly solid claim is the use of methamphetamines in the sport around the 1960s period, although many postulate it began even earlier. 
A New York Times article from June 25, 1968 highlighted the death of German middleweight boxing champion Jupp Elser, allegedly ruling it a homicidal killing. Bei der Obduktion stellt sich heraus, Jupp Elzer hatte Dopingmittel im Blut, unter anderem Pervitin und Reaktivan, Amphetamine. Jupp's exhaustion threshold had been removed by stimulants, fatally increasing his natural strength reserves beyond the danger level and enabling him to take on too much damage for his body to bear. On this occasion, it backfired, but a fighter who could more effectively utilize the drug would be far harder to knock down, garnering a massive advantage. It's somewhat comparable to the myth that PCP gives superhuman strength to those who take it. It's commonly believed that PCP gives you superhuman strength, that it makes people jump off buildings because they think they can fly. Even the skinniest of users wield excessive power, it seems. Well, there is no evidence that it increases strength per se, but it does act as a dissociative analgesic. This means it produces a sense of non-connectedness neurologically and a decrease in pain sensation peripherally. The individual commits more daring and superhuman-like feats due to a carelessness for pain. While researching, I've struggled to find the first positive test for steroids in boxing. There is wide speculation that many boxers throughout the 1980s and early 1990s were using, with accusations being aimed at Mike Tyson and perhaps most notably Evander Holyfield. Holyfield is an important case study. When moving up from cruiserweight to heavyweight, he sought the services of eight times Mr. Olympia, Lee Haney. So we put all of that together. We got Evander from 192 of the 212, 214 pounds of five weeks. Evander was obviously a freak of nature and a ridiculous athlete. Yet his disproportionately large traps, outsized shoulders, enlarged face and insane physique, including muscle striations and protruding abs, in tandem with the easy transition to a different weight class, does raise substantial questions over his natural status. To add to this, during a 2007 investigation of the company Applied Pharmacy Services of Alabama, it was discovered how a customer named Evan Fields was buying human growth hormones. Upon the number listed for Fields being called by investigators, Holyfield himself picked up. But enough of the simple speculation. The first official detection of steroids in boxing, which I could find at least, came in December 1995. Francois Botha beat Axel Schulz in 12 rounds in Stuttgart, Germany to claim the vacant IBF World Heavyweight title. Botha was then stripped of his belt after testing positive for the banned steroid Nandrolone. Despite claims that he had been prescribed the drug for an injury to his arm, the fight was declared a no contest. Now, Nandrolone is an anabolic androgenic steroid. Not only does it assist in building lean muscle mass, but it also increases bone density and promotes muscle endurance and healing. On this last point, Nandrolone reduces immune activity, lessening inflammation and tissue damage, obviously key traits which can hinder boxers in training and actual performance. In fact, Tyson Fury actually tested positive for Nandrolone in February 2015, with the Gypsy King blaming it on eating uncastrated wild boar. Right. Anyways, thanks for watching guys. Apologies that the video was dominated by speculation and general confusion. After all, the information on drugs in boxing is spotty to say the least. Also, an update on the Ryan Garcia fiasco. Multiple news outlets are now saying that Garcia's lawyers have pointed to the test results from samples of two supplements declared by Ryan returning as positive for Osterine contamination, which could see the boxer cleared. Honestly, at this point, who even knows what the outcome will be? Cheers.